We like covering presidential firsts and onlys in this. Uh, for this series, this is the first time we have recorded in the same room together. Mm -hmm. This is the first time that we've recorded since the series launched. Yes. This is the first time we're recording in the about stuff that happens in the 20th century. Oh, man. Uh, Thank God. Yes. But here we are in one room, ready to get 20th century on all your asses. As a podcast venture, it's much better to be able to play a clip of something than just have to describe a daguerreotype. <laughs> yes, exactly. The editing will be much more, um, <laughs> much more dynamic now that we are in the age of recorded sound. And I'm not just looking like, what kind of music did they listen to in, uh, in uh, 18th century New England? And finding research that's just like, in 18th century New England, they listen to vocal only choral performances solely in the context of church. And I'm like, well, thank you, Puritans. That's not very good for uh, podcast editing. But anyway, let's go. The progressives. Mm -hmm. Hi, and welcome to Hell of Presidents. This is episode eight The Progressives. October 2nd, 1919, President Woodrow Wilson suffered a massive stroke, leaving him virtually incapacitated. A neurosurgeon attending to him said he suffered, quote, disorders of emotion, impaired impulse control, and defective judgment. According to Arthur Link, his, quote, recovery was only partial at best. His mind remained relatively clear, but he was physically enfeebled, and the disease had wrecked his emotional constitution and aggravated all his more unfortunate personal traits. For the final 18 months of his presidency, his wife, Edith Wilson, and his physician conspired to limit knowledge of Wilson's health and serve as intermediaries for all presidential business in order to protect the president's fragile state. Now, Edith Wilson's conduct here is, of course, a matter of some debate. The president's opponents at the time were outraged that he was unable to discharge his duties, though afterward, Edith has also been praised for keeping the executive branch stable and afloat during an unprecedented crisis of competency. She's even sometimes referred to as the first female president. Well, tell that to poor Thomas Marshall, <laughs> Wilson's VP. Who gets to not ever be... He could have at least been president for a year or so, getting the history books. Isn't that what they're there to be? Yeah. Uh, but to us, for that very reason, it does beg the question, if you're basically able to weekend at Bernie's the president for nearly half a term, <laughs> what exactly are we doing with this office? So Woodrow Wilson is emblematic of the the revolt, essentially, of, of the middle classes into uh, that are, were birthed out of the creation of the post-Civil War industrial uh, economic revolution and corporate expansion, the, the rise of the trusts and so forth, the, the specter of immiseration uh, and, and, and the erosion of democracy drove this push towards regaining control of the ship of state that revolt was a revolt felt all the way through all social classes from journalists to uh, professors to politicians themselves and even the younger members of the gentry. Uh, because the Civil War had birthed a new federal government with unprecedented power and authority, and that had been administered through this machinery of these two uh, political parties, the Republican and Democratic parties, and who were charged with staffing a federal bureaucracy. And the, the abstraction of those institutions gave them a power, if the people being filled with them were more committed to the institutions than to uh, the bare interests of the party, in this case, the robber barons who paid for it all. <laughs> uh, so presidents in this situation are no longer uh, individual embodiments of an ideological formation or a sectional interest. They're representatives of a new class that does the most voting in elections and saw themselves as standing between the rapacious robber barons at the top of society and the impoverished urban hordes at the bottom. So these voters, these bureaucrats, the makers and consumers of mass media, academics, lawyers, the small bourgeois... They have the largest uh, influence on determining who would hold political power and from whose ranks political leaders were increasingly being drawn. These political leaders abrogated to themselves authority that previous generations had considered tyrannical through the increased regulations and administrative capacity necessary to govern a continental power. The size and complexity of government required a new degree of expertise at all levels of control sufficient to the size of the enterprise. Woodrow Wilson, not a soldier or a party hack or even a lawyer, a professor of political science represents this shift towards a notion of the government as a regulatory machine and as 
politicians as engineers of the machine. So after the social ferment and relative executive paralysis of the Gilded Age, this increasing and increasingly anxious new constituency of the middle class would demand a more active role in government, uh, managing the prosperity and social well-being of its citizens. And so we will see the birth of the regulatory state, the Federal Reserve, direct elections of senators in the first presidential primaries, women's suffrage in the prohibition movement, labor unrest, and first isolationism, and then war. And through all this, though the expectations and actions taken by the progressives would seem to indicate a newly invigorated government standing against private interests running wild over the well-being of society, we can also see the era as a time of ever-increasing capture of government by those very private interests it seems to be fighting. This era, the era of the progressives, will transpire between these two towering figures that are equal but opposite embodiments of the movement, Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. The jock and the nerd, the Chad and the virgin, the moose and, um, I don't know, what do you think Woodrow is, a weasel? That works. Yeah, you know, those famous opposites. So, show us that beautiful moose. Even though Teddy Roosevelt kind of got in there by accident, as we covered in the last episode, slotted into the VP slot by a New York political boss to marginalize him from state politics, and then McKinley suddenly getting plugged by Cholgosh, Teddy Roosevelt was through and through a man of the time, a virile embodiment of the country at a new age. So the sociopathic excess of the Gilded Age robber barons and the resultant catastrophic misery of the laboring classes of the cities helped engender a profound neurosis in politically minded middle class people. America had been built by heroes to fulfill a world destiny, but the application of free labor ideas had actually created a society defined by decadence on one end and squalor on the other with those suspended between the two conditions condemned to wait anxiously in their drawing rooms to be destroyed by the forces of either concentrated wealth or poverty. Where in this new world was there room for a hero? (laughs) Into this breach stepped Teddy Roosevelt to renew the American myth. His strenuous life was the antidote to the lassitude of life in this increasingly mechanized capitalist America. Asserting personal virtue through struggle broke through the moral stagnation denied the deracinating effect of capitalism without challenging capitalism's economic primacy. In Roosevelt, we see a familiar kind of archetype, the melding of a rich, fancy lad personal background with this hyper-masculine public image. But to Roosevelt's credit, he actually did that shit. Teddy was undoubtedly given innumerable advantages for both social and political advancement and his rugged life tourism through his Silver Spoon background, But my man lived about as adventurous a late 19th century life as one could imagine. Of all the uh, epic bacon history guys people like to meme about, he is the one that kind of deserves it. Yeah, he was not amenable to the implications of late 19th century America, which were that there really wasn't a role for uh, human agency anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, The the machines were in charge, the machine of, of capital was in charge uh the that the sense of impotence among political class was was incredibly present as policy was just dictated from the top in a way that created unsustainable social conflict at the bottom Mm -hmm. in the form of a uh unprecedentedly violent labor uh struggle uh that dwarfs anything that you see in any of the european powers that are also into industrializing at this period uh and nothing seemed to be able to be done about it and it led to this real crisis of, of confidence. Uh, and Roosevelt, under, as, a, as a Simon Pure example of the American aristocracy, uh, knew that his life was either going to be uh, watching money accumulate from the sidelines and, and slowly losing any sense of himself as a man and as an American, the, the, the ideas that had driven the country to this point, or he was going to fucking change that. He was going to ch- take charge. And so his body was, his life was fixated on Uh, affirming human agency through constant action. And uh, we're going to do a longish bio of him here in a second, but I think it's important to get his bio in because at every point you can see him kind of uh, 
rejecting the li- a possible life given to him to try to find something new and different as opposed to say somebody of one generation before like Grover Cleveland who we described just being kind of shot up a tube yep. like a pneumatic tube into the into power being like yeah okay sure this is fine a guy who showed up in the right room and shook the right hands didn't piss off the ra- the wrong people and was rewarded for it by being able to sit in the big white house yes the man who paid a hundred dollars to someone to substitute for him in the union army instead of fighting for uh the country yes you think teddy roosevelt would have done that if he, he had been alive during the civil war he would have paid money to get into the union army <laughs> well a lot of them did they they, yes. p- they paid the the, the 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 patriotic rich uh paid to outfit regiments yes with and he would have absolutely done that and his uniform would have been amazing <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt Jr. was born October 27th, 1858 at 28 East 20th Street in Manhattan, New York. The Roosevelts were an old school Dutch family of New York prominence with a string of merchants, businessmen, politicians, and socialites going back to the mid 17th century. An asthmatic child, Teddy learned to minimize his symptoms through physical activity and developed an early love for the outdoors. He was homeschooled, then enrolled in Harvard, where he participated in rowing and boxing, though he found his studies constraining. After his graduation and his father's sudden death, he returned to New York and enrolled at Columbia Law. At both Columbia and Harvard, Teddy was consumed by studies of the U.S. Navy, eventually publishing a book, The Naval War of 1812, when he was just 23. The book is a technical evaluation of both sides of the naval conflict of the war and was immediately considered a great achievement, one of the best in its field. Within a few years, it was required to be put on every U.S. naval vessel uh, as like a handbook for the time. So right off the bat, he's turning technical nerdery into practical success. And let that be a lesson to all you listening out there who fall asleep reading Wikipedia pages about types of trains. In 1880, Roosevelt married Alice Hathaway Lee, and their daughter, Alice Lee Roosevelt, was born in 1884, a fascinating character if you want to look up her uh, on her own right. Tragically, Roosevelt's wife passed away just two days after her daughter's birth. Roosevelt famously marked the day in his diary with a large black X, writing, The light has gone out of my life. And to make the tragedy worse, Roosevelt's mother had died the same day of typhoid fever. Damn. Sucks. Following these two deaths... Teddy left his daughter Alice in the care of his sister Bammy. I'm going to go with Bammy. Let's well, Bammy works. Uh, and threw himself into politics. He was elected to New York State Assembly in 1882, 83, and 84, where he began to make a name for himself as a reformer and anti-corruption man. He attended the 1984 Republican National Convention, where he fought along the other mugwumps to limit James G. Blaine's influence. Though he showed some political skill winning some procedural victories, Blaine's eventual nomination, plus an ill-advised quip to the press indicating Roosevelt might support a good Democrat over Blaine, put him at odds with the party. So he did what any 25-year-old with a minor setback in his budding political career would do, quit the whole thing and lit out to the West. Roosevelt spent the next three years shuttling between New York and his Elkhorn Ranch in North Dakota. He sunk a considerable amount of his inheritance into attempting to become a cattle rancher there. He learned to ride, rope, hunt, and generally be a rancher, slowly earning respect from the locals and eventually organizing some of them into a stockman's association to solve local concerns. Theodore Roosevelt even tracked some boat thieves down the Missouri River, along with his ranch hands in a copy of Anna Karenina. (laughs) <laughs> he captured the thieves, then marched them overland at shotgun point, collecting a $50 reward for their capture. It's important to remember that while we, he is certainly more uh, Chad than Wilson, he is at deep down just as much of a nerd. Mm-hmm. Gotta, gotta go hunt these cattle thieves. Got my shotgun, got my rucksack, got a canteen, and a Karenina. Let's go. <laughs> gotta, look, I'm going to get bored out there. Gotta read. Roosevelt's ranching business collapsed over the severe winter of 85-86, and Roosevelt returned to New York. He married Edith Kermit Caro in 1886 in London, then returned to public life. New York Republicans put him up for mayor of New York later that year, which he lost. But after throwing his support behind Benjamin Harrison as he defeated Blaine for the Republican nomination for president in 1888, Harrison appointed Roosevelt to the United States Civil Service Commission. 
Roosevelt attacked the role with zeal, vigorously enforcing new civil service laws, even though he was referred to as a, quote, veritable bull in a china shop by his friend and biographer, Joseph Bishop, who said, quote, the very citadel of spoils politics, the hereto impregnable fortress that had extended unshaken since it was erected on the foundation laid by Andrew Jackson was tottering to its fall under the assaults of this audacious and irrepressible young man. Uh, it's very fitting that Roosevelt was was that focused on uh, civil service reform because that really was the wedge that uh, pried the party system and the uh, state bureaucracy away from popular influence mm -hmm. and allowed it to have the uh, self and self perception to be filled by men committed to the idea of a uh, of a professional government, not an ideological one. Now, of course. It's still an ideological government right. because it's being done on behalf of a committee of bourgeois, but it is not experienced as such through things like civil service reform. Mm -hmm. And so for a guy like Roosevelt, who is committed to asserting human agency, that becomes important. He, uh, as you said, he went to law school, but he never really practiced law uh, and he didn't sit on his money. He said uh, when he decided not to pursue a career in law, he said, quote, uh, I intend to become a member of the governing class. He wanted to assert the existence of this third force in, in America between the hordes and, and, and the rich who can steer the ship and have a uh, and uh, make decisions dispassionately from a well of personal virtue as the founders had. Yes. And this is in a way to reaffirm the notion of the founders of a dispassionate, morally virtuous leadership uh, in a context of advanced capitalism. In 1894, he was made the police commissioner of New York, another role he took to with enthusiasm. Teddy modernized the police, cracked down on cop corruption, established physical exams for cops, and instituted hiring based on physical and mental standards rather than political appointments. He befriended Jacob Reese, and inspired by the journalist's coverage of the poor lives of downtown immigrants, worked hard to, quote, clean up the slums of New York. He clashed with bosses of both political parties over enforcing Sunday closing laws, not serving alcohol on Sunday. Then he attended and even delighted in protests they organized against him. I've read one anecdote of him uh, kind of laughing on the sidelines, chuckling to himself as a, a group of, you know, Tammany Hall uh, uh, partisans like burned him in effigy in downtown New York, <laughs> which is not the first time that that's happened in this series. The, uh, the effigy burning. Oh, we loved it. Yes. We should bring that back. In 1896, after supporting McKinley in the election, Teddy was made assistant secretary of the Navy, where he had broad influence over the department. He urged buildup and modernization of the Navy and pressed McKinley to take an aggressive stance against Spain in Cuba. Teddy ordered the Navy to begin preparing for war before McKinley had even declared it after the USS Maine explosion. And once war were declared, Teddy's orders were credited by George Dewey for the decisive victory at the Battle of Manila which he was we referenced last week as handing the Philippines to America. He was uh Roosevelt was just itching to fight. Yes. Uh he before the declaration he was going behind uh McKinley's back and saying that he quote had the backbone of a chocolate eclair. <laughs> just literally trying to get him to uh to declare war to prove he wasn't a wuss, yes. which he basically did. Yes. Of course when war with Spain officially breaks out, Roosevelt quits his post at the Department of Navy, which is also funny. He's like revving up this whole thing for war like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I've got your back." And then as soon as it's gone, it's like, "No, I actually need a gun in my hand." Absolutely. And forms the first US volunteer cavalry regiment the fabled Rough Riders. I hope we're dropping uh, uh, DMX right now. <laughs> Rough Rider and yes, Can we do course. that or will we get sued? No, we'll put that in. Absolutely. Roosevelt trains this motley group of volunteers in San Antonio for a week, uh, few weeks in the spring. Then on June 23rd, 1898, they land in Cuba. On July 1st, 1898, Theodore Roosevelt participated in the Battle of San Juan Hill. After the Spanish forces at the top of San Juan Heights were pounded by Gatling gun fire and the hills had been stormed by the regulars of the 10th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers, Roosevelt, without orders from a superior, commanded his Rough Riders up the neighboring Kettle Hill. They fought their way up under the cover of Gatling fire and fought briefly hand-to-hand -hand with the Spanish on top. I'm really trying to make this more dramatic, but they kind of just ran up a hill. Uh, the black soldiers and the Gatling guns seemed like they did most of the work there. But still, Teddy is the one in the center of the iconic photograph, and he's got that killer stash going, and he's pulling off a stellar fit in his Rough Rider garb. So, you know, he gets the thanks. Thank you, Colonel Roosevelt. 
The capture of San Juan Heights would lead to a successful siege of Santiago, and the Spanish would surrender by August 13th. Upon returning to New York, Roosevelt was recruited by Republican boss Tom Platt to run for governor. Platt disliked and distrusted Roosevelt, but needed a strong candidate to win, so he put Roosevelt in there, and he won. Yeah, because if you don't have anything to offer people in a time of great economic crisis, and you're committed to the same principles that have seen them all immiserated, you need personalities, and mm-hmm. Roosevelt was a personality. Yes, he was in that photo. He, was, he looked like a, a battle hero. Roosevelt governed New York with typical zeal for reform, getting many civil service-minded appointments in the state by Platt, and now forging new tactics around shaping corporate power in relation to the state and labor. And then, in 1900, eager to be rid of Roosevelt, Platt engineered him to be McKinley's vice president in his second term. And he was, and they won. And on September 6th, 1901, McKinley takes two in the gut from Cholgosh. It's so funny how many of these guys got assassinated before they were like, we should have some security around them. <laughs> it was wild. <laughs> they let three of them three go of down. Them, just a dude walking up to him. Hey, buddy, bang. <laughs> we, did, we didn't anticipate that someone could just walk up to a person. And what's crazy is Andrew Jackson was almost killed that way, too. Yes. We didn't talk about it, but when at the height of the bank crisis, a, a, a crazed Federalist ran up to him <laughs> on the steps of the Capitol, pulled out two flintlock pistols, pulled both triggers, and they both misfired. <sighs> Yeah, I it, it the, the the lack of presidential security is one of the most baffling things at the top level of this government. I think it's part of our generalized denial of what we're building. Yes. It's like, no, no, we're a humble yeoman country. Yeah. Our our institutions are humble. It's fine. You have cheese in the fucking White House. It's all normal. <laughs> Even as things get bigger and bigger and more important and, and the presidency becomes more of a focus of energy mm-hmm. uh, and power and people get more emotionally committed to who's president. Uh, and more wanting to uh, see that emotion of, uh, expressed somehow, just a continued refusal yes. to accept the reality. So McKinley takes two in the gut. Hello, President Colonel Roosevelt. So that is a big chunk of Teddy bio. I didn't even mention some of the other doodly gems in there. He had traveled to Egypt and the Holy Land as a kid, studied German in Germany, climbed the Matterhorn. He got a shotgun for his 14th birthday, hunted mountain goats in Montana, where he also got in a bar fight in Mingusville. He published like six more books on various aspects of living a vigorous life. As we said above, he did that shit. But it's important as he is the guy that breaks this handsome Ohio generals versus Tammany Hall crooks cycle. We're trying to stay away from great man shit here. But as we pointed off every so often in American presidential history, there is a guy on a horse. And Teddy is the guy on the horse at the dawn of the 20th century. Yes. When when Roosevelt emerges on the scenes, you have a general crisis in America. The conditions on the ground. Uh, created by capitalism and its immiseration in the in the in the condition of a uh, foreclosure of the uh, a rapid urbanization and foreclosure of the of the frontier foreclosure mm-hmm. of the yeoman dream uh, you're seeing a massive increase of things like p- prairie populism uh, uh, anarchists and socialists organizing working class people in the cities uh, and the expansion of a technological mass culture around just ex- huge population growth in the form of immigration. Uh, creates this huge pressure that the two-party system, as solidified out of the Civil War, just cannot contain. You have these patriotic networks, you have these captive voter blocks, uh, uh, all voting on regional issues about who shot... I vote against whoever shot my grandpa, basically, (laughs) uh, defines the the, the choices of the people on the ground in politics. Meanwhile, the choices at the top are entirely captured by this emerging, unprecedented uh, corporate concentration of of power. Uh, And the pe- the syst- the people the system was producing were also incapable of changing it because they were the the Clevelands they were the time servers because that was what were rewarded by the system uh, because of uh, Ro- Roosevelt's privileged position within society his role as one of the aristocrats his decision to step down basically from Olympus into the arena as he liked to call it uh, and then live a life premised on that notion created a figure who could embody uh, a challenge to this this uh, stultified system. Not from below, because the, the working class uh, and the laboring classes have not organized sufficiently to that perspective, to that point, uh, but from the middle, which is much more febrile because of its tighter concentration, its greater degree of wealth, its greater degree of education, and its access to uh, the meritocratic pathways to power. Uh, to them... He represents a new way forward, a new way to relate to government 
that maintains our uh, pretensions of um, independence uh, and, and uh, uh, cowboy liberty, but also allows the state to do things. <laughs> Roosevelt entered office assuring all he would be a continuation of McKinley's policies. Through his two terms, he would pursue a strongly antitrust and pro-regulatory agenda, moving steadily toward the leftward side of the Republican Party domestically. Roosevelt appealed directly to the people to build support for the Department of Commerce and Labor, which was established early in early 1903. This included the Bureau of Corporations, which would later become the Federal Trade Commission, which monitored anti-competitive practices in corporations. Under Roosevelt, the Justice Department filed notable antitrust suits against the Northern Securities Company, a railroad conglomerate under J.P. Morgan and E.H. Harriman, and the Beef Trust. Fuckers. Those, those fuckers at the God Beef Trust. Beef Trust. A conspiracy among the six largest meat packers found to be fixing prices for livestock and beef. Roosevelt pursued strengthening the Interstate Commerce Commission to regulate railroads, pursued an antitrust suit against Standard Oil in 1906, which would lead to the company being broken up a few years later, and got huge corporations like U.S. Steel to submit to regulation under the Bureau of Corporations. Roosevelt worked with Congress to pass the Pure Food and Drugs Act of 1906, regulating sanitation and packaging of foods. And finally, a crusader for conservation, Roosevelt put 230 million acres of land into public protection as national forests, monuments, and game preserves. So basically, it's a roll call of the progressive agenda, and TR becomes known as the Trust Buster, a crusader against big business and corporate interests, a champion of the three C's of his, quote, square deal, conservation, control of corporations, and consumer protection. Quote, when I say that I am for the square deal, I mean not merely that I stand for fair play under the present rules of the game, but that I stand for having those rules change so as to work for a more substantial equality of opportunity and of reward for equally good service. But I think we want to take a bit of a closer look at what's going on here under the hood of Roosevelt progressivism. So the, the essence of Roosevelt progressivism is that it is this middle class uh, bureaucratic revolt against uh, the uncoordinated uh, will of a uh, non-class conscious ruling class, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, and so what that meant is that it did not include any significant redistribution. Mm -hmm. The concept of redistribution of resources is still anathema to the, the hallowed notions of property as freedom that right. underlied America's ideology, that all these people believed at a, low, a level below consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, they were foundational beliefs. Uh, so they weren't going to, absent pressure from outside, address redistribution and as he said the the uh organized uh working class proletarian energy didn't exist to assert itself so what that meant in practice is that the first the, the progressive movement was regulatory right it was an attempt to abrogate two uh bureaucrats decisions from private uh, corporate power i think a good example of this i think we were talking about this is is um everybody remembers the jungle the uh, the Upton Sinclair novel about the meatpacking industry, and he had wrote that as to be an expose on the labor conditions yes. of the time, of how awful the laborers had it. But when the middle class read it, what they read is, oh my God, there's a Polish guy's thumb in my food. <laughs> exactly. And that's why uh, uh, Roosevelt, uh, after Roosevelt passed the F uh, F uh, Pure Food and Drug Act as a result of the uproar caused by the jungle, Upton Sinclair, earnest socialist that he was, said, I aimed for America's heart and I hit him in the stomach. Yes. Uh, so... You have things like the FDA. You have things like uh, the regime of trust busting, breaking up concentrations uh, of capital at the top to reduce the influence of individual capitalists. Uh, and it's not so much the government taking over it as it, as it is a uh, negotiated transfer of power uh, that is done largely consensually, not just because those in power could see that there was a genuine threat of social revolt caused by the continued immiseration of their laborers and, and, and the danger of continued labor agitation amongst those dispossessed laborers, uh, but also because uh, during Roosevelt's uh, presidency, we see uh, an example of how the uncoordinated uh, efforts of the uh, ruling class could lead to a apocalyptic collapse, not, not another slump, not another panic, uh, but a, a genuine threat to the system, which is now much more uh, complicated mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, fragile as a result of that. Uh, and so in 1907, there is one of those classic panics that dominated 19th century uh, economic history. Uh, uh, but 
because of the increased amount of paper out there, uh, the danger to the economy was greater than, oh, well, they're going to leave the fields fallow for a few weeks and some poor people starve. This mm-hmm. is a thing that could have set the apple cart over. But there was no mechanism existing in government to do anything about it, to inject liquidity into the system, which is what was necessary. And so the richest man in America, J.P. Morgan, uh, king of Wall Street, locks 120 bankers at his own initiative, mm-hmm. deciding, realizing that this can, only, this can only be stopped by the power of Wall Street you know, acting co- under coordinated uh, will. So he gets 120 bankers in his library on, on November 3rd, 1907, and has to strong arm these guys because they don't want to fucking cooperate. They, they, they want, they're all in competition with one another. They imagine themselves in competition with one another, and they all don't want to participate to something in something that's going to benefit the other guy. But because of Morgan's preeminent position of power, he was able to see the whole board in a way that they couldn't and therefore strong arm these guys into agreeing to a deal what, that had him sending Henry Frick and Albert Gary by an overnight train to Washington to convince Roosevelt to set aside antitrust laws to let the U.S. Steel Company buy up more steel interests and inject liquidity mm-hmm. into the system privately. Uh, and the, uh, that event, I think, clarified to everyone at every level of real influence that some sort of governmental oversight of the money supply was going to be absolutely necessary. And that comes with it a whole other suggestion of uh, government regulatory powers that need to be asserted to keep this machinery going. The thing that makes this necessary is the size and complexity of the machinery, which is unprecedented. Right. And at the same time that Roosevelt is uh, uh, regulating capital, uh, on behalf of the consumer and the citizen, he is also regulating capital on behalf of workers in the form of, for the first fucking time, actually being an honest broker in a fucking labor struggle, which never happened in the <laughs> 19th century. Every single labor struggle, no matter who is in power, Democrat or Republican, you can be goddamn sure the National Guard is going to get called in. Copy, posse comitatus will be suspended, <laughs> and they will start injunctioning your ass. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Roosevelt... Uh, intervened in a strike between the United Mine Workers and mine owners in 1902 uh, and got the mine owners to take a deal and, and agree to a nine-hour day and a pay increases uh, at the, of course, insistence that the mine, uh, the mine union not be recognized. Uh, so give with one hand, take with the other, but the whole process is a standing up of federal uh, uh, regulatory capacity uh, to facilitate crucially capitalists c- capitalism's continued stability all all of that is of course fascinating the uh jp morgan late night library shutdown uh i think that would be a good like uh, another good uh uh ins what is he in ionesco ianucci ianucci yes Ianesco. that would be a good ianucci movie yeah yeah that would be honestly good it would ianucci be a good movie. ionesco play too <laughs> yeah but the, the the minute by minute of getting all these guys it's it's really thrilling to lock in the morgan really had the sense in that meeting that they had but hours to yeah. act before the entire economy collapsed. Yeah. Uh, and of course, all those guys were acting as petulant babies, yep. not wanting to do anything. So it would be good. And just while we're on his domestic policies, Roosevelt also appointed Charles Joseph Bonaparte, who is Napoleon's grandnephew to attorney general. Joseph Bonaparte established the Bureau of Investigation, which would later become the FBI. Uh, I just thought this was funny that Teddy Roosevelt appointed a descendant of Napoleon to begin the FBI. That is some League of Extraordinary Gentlemen type shit. Indeed. So, Theodore Roosevelt is the speak softly and carry a big stick guy. What that means, practically, is expanding American influence around the world into the Philippines in the West, into the Caribbean, and Central America to the South. As we noted last week, McKinley basically gave an, oh, shucks, oh, what are we going to do with these Philippines argument for keeping the territories? And it fell to Roosevelt to make that policy official. Roosevelt was convinced the Philippines would not be ready for self-rule if the U.S. left, an opinion that was bolstered by insurrections under the military governorship of William Howard Taft. So... This move towards imperial management that you see under Roosevelt is uh, part of his and the uh, movement that he represents bedrock understanding that built on all previous ruling class understandings of America is that continued American prosperity 
uh, and social peace depended upon some sort of frontier. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner uh, uh, pointed that out back then. It's it's still true. Is that the the, the, it, the only question is whether you. Uh, it's usually been moralized one way or the other. Like Frederick Jackson Turner thought the frontier was a good thing. Anti-imperialists think it's a bad thing. That's beside the point that it's a necessary thing mm-hmm. for the American political economy to operate. And so that is why you see uh, during the standing up of the state as such in the post-Civil War period and the closure of the American frontier, the attempt to as- affirm American power beyond its borders. Now, America had always sought that but most, it had been a regional project of the Southern planters, mm-hmm. and it had been restrained by the uh, the, con- the interests of uh, Northern capital, which were to concentrate before they went out getting more land, because mm-hmm. land is less important. And they didn't get that because they were a bunch of landowners. Right. But once the, that sectional interest has been conquered by capital and been brought into capitalism, they can become now a national project. And so you see the attempt to basically just take over for one power its uh, empire that it wasn't able to effectively administer anymore. In the hey, you guys aren't Spain. using this anymore. Hey, it's like, hey, Spain, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> and so uh, we, we took it over. And Roosevelt uh, was committed to the project of extending American power. Uh, formally, for reasons of uh, glory and all of that uh, cultural stuff that mm-hmm. does win elections, uh, but more concretely to uh, open markets to American pro- products uh, and also play, uh, access resources for American industry uh, at, at a cheap price. Uh, and the Philippine insurrection is after the Plains Wars and the, uh, the seminal wars before them, uh, part of a chain of sort of education in imperial management that America takes through Vietnam and then to uh, the current uh, global war on terror and, and, and everything that comes with that. Uh, and so the Philippine insurrection and re- repression of it is really a Vietnam experience. Uh, it involves massive war crimes. Uh, it involves dehumanization of people we are supposed to be there to, uh, to introduce to democracy to uh, and system- systematic uh, torture as a, as a uh, mechanism of control. Um, and... Then in South America and Latin America, uh, it, you see the uh, innovations in soft power mm-hmm. and influential power, dollar diplomacy and the like, that end up uh, taking over for uh, formal empire after World War II, mm-hmm. when we have to start administering, finally, our destiny of a global uh, imperium. So yes, along those lines, Roosevelt also pushed for the creation of the Panama Canal, engineering a series of events to pass the ownership of the Canal Zone from Colombia to a newly independent Panama and then to the U.S. Yes, because at that, at, when, uh, when the U.S. looked at Panama as the, the ideal spot for a, a canal, it was the, at that point the more northernmost province of Colombia. Right. It was not an independent country. Uh, and Colombia had no interest in uh, dealing with the United States uh, and ceding uh, territory to them to build the canal. Uh, so the Roosevelt administration uh, funded and invented from whole cloth a, the Panamanian independence movement. Mm-hmm. It was uh, much the same way that the uh, the Americans' uh, annexationist movement in ha- Hawaii was mm-hmm. made up of Sanford Dole and his friends. <laughs> uh, the Panama Canal independence movement was a, a creature of American uh, power. Uh, but because Colombia was going through its own problems, they were able to uh, make it enough of a headache for Colombia to grant Panama its independence uh, and then to have Panama then sign over control of the uh, amendment in a ceremony where no Panamanians were present. <laughs> uh, and this really gets at the the libidinal appeal of politics that draws people like Roosevelt to it, is that the Panama Canal swindle, basically, was something that they reveled in. Mm-hmm. They, they were absolutely giddy with how they'd gotten away with something. And they had <laughs> parties with champagne cheering on their their wicked little criminalities. These guys got such a kick out of their little clandestine game they played in Panama that when Roosevelt asked his Secretary of War, Elihu Root, if he'd done a good enough job denying the accusations that he'd been responsible for fomenting the rebellion in Panama that led to the canal signing, he said... You certainly have, Mr. President. You have shown that you were accused of seduction, and you have conclusively proved that you were guilty of rape. 
Uh, and it's, those are the kind of things that keep you in the arena and make it interesting. Uh, charting the destiny of the world. Rewriting the map. And the symbolic capstone to Roosevelt's foreign policy was the Great White Fleet. Roosevelt, obsessed with boats from a young age, sought to obtain American dominance through a powerful navy. America's naval buildup took place across the final decades of the 19th century, but became a centerpiece of Roosevelt's policy. TR sent the 16 battleships and a number of escort ships around the world to demonstrate America's fast-growing naval power and announcing the U.S. ascendance as one of the great power nations, with stops on six continents. Yeah, the Great White Fleet is America's coming out party as a military power that can contend with the old world. After spending the 19th century fighting with itself and then coming to terms with itself, it is now ready to assert power globally in the form of a big old fleet of white-ass ships. <laughs> yes. Look at my ships. <laughs> Look at all my ships. <laughs> yeah, Battle ships, destroyers, <laughs> cruisers, motherfucking canoes. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it makes sense that Roosevelt would be obsessed with boats, not just for the glory of uh, boats and, and his fascination with the technical aspects of naval warfare, but a navy is good for power projection. You can take it anywhere. Roosevelt was part of a generation who had learned at the feet of Alfred Thayer Mahane, a military strategist who wrote an incredibly influential book called The Influence of Sea Power on History, where he right. claimed that the, the determiner of the national destiny is your naval projective capacity, mm -hmm. uh, which really did anticipate what a global system would really inquire, require uh, and the technology that that would also require. Uh, and uh, Roosevelt was absolutely uh, uh, an addict like of them, and, and it was a, a understood thing. It's also what helped lead to World War I because the Germans started trying to uh, do the same shit. Do a, they started a uh, naval arms race with the British. Uh, so yeah, Roosevelt was totally in keeping with the, the thinking at the time. You cannot... You cannot guarantee your country's destiny in its contest for power uh, over the globe without a big-ass navy. I'm going to really brush over uh, Teddy's 1904 re-election because he honestly blows it out of the water. Hey, we're just talking about navy boats. He's blowing it out of the water, uh, both internationally and domestically. Both William Jennings Bryan and Cleveland declined to run for the Democrats, so they put up this absolute stiff Alton B. Parker a bourbon Democrat from New York with a literal millionaire mine owner who is also 80 years old as his running mate. Uh, they get destroyed, winning only the Solid South. Uh, TR wins re-election with 56% of the popular vote to Parker's 37.6, a margin not seen since the era of good feelings. Kaboom! Not much to say on this other than that the sectional interests of the South still trump everything else there. Yeah, it's the only uh, real resistance point to uh, a a ideologized um, realignment right away from geography yeah was the south everyone else was ready to vote for the candidate mm -hmm. but not not the south because it was key to maintaining the their uh racial order uh and so in 1908 roosevelt declined to run again uh which he probably could have done Instead, he chose Secretary of War William Howard Taft as his successor, despite some attempts to wrangle control of the Republican Party away from the progressive Roosevelt faction and back to the more conservative factions. And so Taft, the big man from Ohio, goes up against William Jennings Bryan, back for one last bite at the apple. And failing to generate any significant distinction between himself and the now progressive Republican Party, Bryan makes his worst showing of any of his three runs in the popular vote losing across the North besides Nebraska and Colorado. But with his three runs for president totaling 493 collective electoral votes, William Jennings Bryan has the most electoral votes of any man not elected president in U.S. history. Yeah, jeez. You got to feel for the guy. Yeah. He's, he's re the, the, the uh, Buffalo Bills of American presidency. <laughs> yeah, so the Democrats have a real crisis of conflict. Uh, confidence here the, their appeal which had been a broad populist one after uh after the brian nomination in 96 uh coupled with the, the sectional one uh was collapsing in the face of a republican party that was willing to challenge the orthodoxy that had frozen both parties during the gilded age right uh and so william jennings bryan representing a uh a populism that was now being carried out by the opposing party uh, is is left without a raise on debt. Very similar, I would argue, to uh, Bob Dole's run in 1996. <laughs> uh, at that point, the party's prerogative had been superseded by its opponent, and uh, all they could do was eat shit. <laughs> uh, yes, and the Republicans, they got a good thing going on here. Uh, if 
if they could manage the transition uh, from pop, uh, um, uh, Republican progressivism to be, being a charismatic cult of uh, a powerful embodied leader and something that could be institutionalized under the rule of a rather gray bureaucrat. We'll see. <laughs> we will see. William Howard Taft. Taft! The presidential one that almost weighs a quarter ton. Six foot two over 330 pounds. Born in Cincinnati, Ohio. Shout they out. They love making presidents in Ohio. They do. On September 15th, 1857, his father, Alfonso Taft, a great name, uh, was a judge and also attorney general at and war secretary under Ulysses S. Grant. Taft studied at Yale, where he was the first of three presidents to be a member of the Skull and Bone Society, a society co-founded by his father. He returned to Ohio, passed the bar, and worked his way up the legal system. Taft's goal in life was to become a Supreme Court justice, and basically everything in his political story points to that goal while keeping it hilariously out of his reach. He was appointed assistant prosecutor of Hamilton County and then to the Superior Court of Cincinnati, a position he would have to run for after his one-year appointment was up. He ran for it and won in 1888, the only time he would seek an elected position before running for president. In 1890, Taft actively campaigned for an appointment by President Harrison for an open seat on the Supreme Court. And though he did not get it, Harrison appointed him Solicitor General. In 1886, Taft married Cincinnati socialite Helen Herron, called Nellie, and in 1890, the family moved to D.C. for Taft's new gig. Helen encouraged Taft in his political career and desired entry into the world of Washington society, though Taft stayed focused on his judicial career and mostly hung out with Supreme Court justices. But in 1892, he was appointed to a federal judgeship on the Sixth Court and sent back to Cincinnati. Taft gets called back to Washington in 1900, again getting his hopes up for a Supreme Court appointment, but instead McKinley dispatches him to the Philippines to head a civilian government there. Taft dutifully takes the position, assured that if he fulfills the assignment, the next vacant Supreme Court seat would be his. There's an amazing picture of him on a horse yes. uh, in the Philippines, and you just feel for the guy, yes. because he didn't want the job. No, uh, he looks very hot. Yes, and he was while he was there, he was very committed to carrying out the civilizing mission mm -hmm. that underlied the, the liberal justification for imperialism, but uh, his troops had other ideas. Right. There was a song, marching song that uh, American troops in the Philippines were known to sing, uh, after, and after uh, Taft had given a speech talking about the need to reach out to our, quote, little brown brothers among the <laughs> Filipinos. And it went, they say we have brown brothers here, but here I draw the line. He may be a brother to Big Bill Taft, but he ain't no brother of mine. Wow. Yeah. So it's like he crazy. They invented waterboarding. <laughs> <laughs> it is. The, that is the two sides of this uh, uh, Philippine uh, uh, project here because Taft and Nelly head, head to the Philippines and Taft takes his assignment with a paternalistic mix of condescension and magnanimity. Uh, the general sense is he was there because the Filipinos were incapable of self-rule and would be for some time. And yet at the highest levels, even while they were doing all that waterboarding of the people on the ground, uh, the Tafts made effort to prevent racial segregation and treat the Filipinos with social equals, at least in the president, in the governor's uh, mansion. Taft would eventually travel to Rome and negotiate with the Pope to free up lands controlled by the Catholic Spanish priests for Filipino ownership. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's like it's it's this um, on on one hand taking your civilizing duty seriously, but you know there's a lot of baggage in the word civilizing. You know, yeah. In 1902, another Supreme Court seat would become vacant, but Taft would again dutifully refuse to take it, believing his work as Governor General was incomplete. Instead, Roosevelt made Taft the Secretary of War, a position from which he could still administer the Philippines as well as preside over the separation of Panama from Colombia and the administration of the canal construction. Roosevelt and Taft had been friends since around 1890, and by Roosevelt's second term with Taft as Secretary of War, it was clear that Taft would be Roosevelt's successor. Facing relatively little opposition at either the convention or in the general election, as outlined above, Taft became president March 4th, 1909. So a lot of Taft background there, uh, but what are we to make of this Roosevelt Taft transition? Uh, it is a attempt, as I said, to institutionalize the progressive current within the Republican Party and take it uh, away from the personal uh, being of Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and 
that actually uh, became a difficulty of the campaign. Uh, many people uh, accused Taft of being too close to Roosevelt, of being just a puppet for Roosevelt, because there was a sense that uh, motivated, I think, more than anything, uh, Roosevelt's decision to not seek a third term, because obviously he wanted to seek oh, a third yes, term. Oh, yes, of course. But the Washington uh, 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 precedent that had been set of two terms and you're done mm-hmm. – uh, was how you proved that you weren't a power-seeking maniac, that you were a gentleman, that you were mm-hmm. not out to rule for its own sake, which is what all these guys were going through incredible kabuki-like pains always <laughs> to uh, avoid the impression of. That's why for most of the 19th century, they didn't campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't show up at the uh, party's conventions. Right. It was unseemly. Right. Uh, and so Roosevelt basically was forced by this expectation to hand this thing over. Uh, and it fucking worked because uh, there wasn't really much other than a fear of uh, of of Roosevelt as uh, Imperator, which since people liked him, wasn't really that much of a fear. Uh, and hey, he had only been elected one time. Yeah. He, yeah. He should have gone for it. And, and uh, but you said, Chris, uh, apparently there was one. Taft scandal that actually uh, made its way into the campaign. Yes, Taft was our first golf's too much president. <laughs> uh, he got uh, pilloried in the press at the time for for being seen on the golf on the links too many times uh, as um, both when he was campaigning and as president. And there are some fairly funny photos of of Taft uh, golfing around the time. Uh, the, and also of that, as you were saying, being seen as a puppet of Roosevelt. Uh, some of the press said Taft stood for take advice from Teddy. <laughs> and you know what? Hey, people were like, I hope he does. We, yes. we love it, folks. We love it. And so this charmless administrator is able to uh, win power uh, because the progressive agenda is popular and at this point still identified with the Democrat or the Republicans because they had initiated it at the federal level, even though, of course, it was bipartisan throughout states uh, and, and third party. Uh, like Wisconsin with the progressive party there uh, in other states. But the funny, of course, the funniest thing, of course, is that he didn't even want to really be president. He wanted to be, be the, the Supreme, Supreme Court, Court Justice. Justice. Yes. Uh, and he really decided to, to run because his wife really wanted to be first lady. My wife. She really wanted in on those all the fancy Washington she parties. She wanted to choose what the drapes were. She wanted to, she wanted to buy the China. Christmases. She wanted yeah. to host dignitaries. And then within a year of him getting elected, she had a stroke. Poor Nellie Taft. Poor Nellie Taft. And poor yeah, William Howard, who just had to do this stupid job <laughs> and doesn't even no even reason to do it anymore. Uh, but I do want to t- touch on three things of the, about the Taft administration before we move on to the much more dramatic election of 1912. Uh, Taft's most direct continuation of the Roosevelt progressivism is his continuation of Bustin' Trust. Bustin' makes him feel good. Bustin' makes me feel good. Taft pursued 70 cases in his four years under the Sherman Antitrust Act, almost double what Roosevelt had brought in his eight years of office. In 1911, Taft's Justice Department sought to break up U.S. Steel into dozens of subsidiaries. The issue of U.S. Steel being allowed to grow under the Roosevelt administration, which again was allowed to happen to uh, advert the crisis of 1907, uh, became a personal one for Roosevelt, who felt his honor and intentions were being besmirched by some of the filings in the case. This would come into play as Roosevelt returns the next year. Domestically, Taft also messes around with the tariffs. Um, We've been talking about the tariffs forever, but here's where the issue kind of gets resolved off the table. Because as part of Taft's tariff negotiations, Congress sought to add an income tax to supplement some of the federal earnings. And more on that in a second. Taft refused to do this through legislation, suspecting the Supreme Court would strike it down. And so in Taft's term, we get the proposition of the 16th Amendment establishing the income tax. The eventual tariff Taft signs was seen as harshly raising rates, going against progressive Republican values, and as well presaged the party's eventual turn on Taft. He, you know, he's a Republican from Ohio, okay? You, ca- you cannot expect him not to raise tariffs. It's in their blood. <laughs> it's in their blood. It's all they know. Yes. All they know is eat hot, chip, raise tariff, <laughs> and lie, Ohio <laughs> presidents. Taft also pushes, as Matt alluded to previously, dollar, dollar bills, y'all. Dollar diplomacy in Central and South America, pushing American dominance in the region through financial means, largely buying up or securing foreign debt from these countries to gain financial leverage. 
This is an expansion of the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. If Western Hemisphere countries show weakness or are faltering domestically, it's America's right and duty to intervene to protect them and, of course, America's interests from European domination. There was a very real fear, and in, in several instances in the 19th century, a genuine threat of uh, European uh, financiers of uh, Latin American debt showing up to fucking foreclose on the thing and to mm-hmm. seize the assets. And the Roosevelt Corollary and, and dollar diplomacy are designed to ensure that if uh, Latin American countries are going to go into ruinous debt to uh, foreign interests, it's going to be ours. <laughs> uh, because well, that, we're here there to protect them, of course. Because this this is how we establish shy of an, a formal empire, which the, uh, the the land crazed freaks of the southern gentry wanted, a, a informal financial empire, right. which is what guys like Hamilton and Henry Clay uh, were dreaming of. Like, what are you idiots worried about the land for when, when you have the fucking money, you don't need the goddamn land, <laughs> uh, which they could never get because they were sitting around it all day drinking their goddamn uh, mint juleps and getting syphilis <laughs> so uh the thing about this to uh reckon with is that the progressive era's racine is about the rationalization of american power and the abstraction of administration to bureaucracy that is uh first and foremost uh loyal in a personal uh and financial level uh to the institutions not to uh either capital or the the streets uh <laughs> and that means the creation of structures that would eventually help create uh, help the United States become the world headquarters of the capitalist imperium. You have the creation of an imperial military power in the Philippines, the dominion of the dollar in the Western Hemisphere, and in the years between 1900 and the Second World War, the U.S. went on to invade El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, support a coup in Honduras, all of these interventions on behalf of local elites friendly to American interests, mm-hmm. uh, primarily cash crop or agriculture or the companies that buy it from them, with the explicit purpose of preventing the sort of broad-based agricultural and economic redistribution that would have increased the political power of the common people and therefore increased the cost of doing business for American exporters. Most of these military actions occurred with very little public debate in the United States mm-hmm. or public knowledge. The machinery hums in the background. The cost of bananas stays low, and Americans go about their business largely unaware that their country has taken the role of imperial hegemon. The 19th century was when the United States secured its territorial dominion of the West of North America, and the 20th century would begin with the United States' capital interests and American state capacity, both created by the process uh, of territorial dominion of the West, extend U.S. power into Latin America, but without formal infrastructure of european colonialism and it's this model that the united states will adopt to its global imperium following world war ii on this policy and again this this gets at that that thing where it's uh you know the stick in one hand but but to the public face you're saying look at how kind we are taft would say this policy has been characterized as substituting dollars for bullets It is one that appeals alike to idealistic humanitarian sentiments to the dictates of sound policy and strategy and the legitimate commercial aims. Yep. And it also uh, uh, reduces the resistance uh, from uh, the racial class that we have in America mm-hmm. because uh, anti-imperialism that emerges uh, in two quarters at, uh, during this period uh, is either a northern liberal objection or along moral aims or a populist ob- objection to uh, mongrelizing the American electorate. Mm-hmm. The fear is that these these colonies that were taken from the Spaniards would be turned into American states mm-hmm. and would in, uh, include uh, lead to the inclusion of non-whites into chambers of power because there are no white people there. Uh, and this new arrangement is perfect for uh, minimizing the uh, threat to the stability of the political system while ma- maximizing uh, the American uh, financial gain to be had in in. Uh, in dealing with these countries. Finally, I want to touch briefly on civil rights, since I think Taft represents a kind of final complete collapse of Republican interest or investment in it. Roosevelt had insisted on not removing or replacing black appointees to various positions like postmasters, collectors, etc., where they had already been appointed, and had even caused a stir by inviting black political figures like Booker T. Washington to the White House dinners. Taft reversed these policies, refusing to appoint blacks if there was white resistance. And white resistance was increasing during this period because uh, 
as uh, the progressive era uh, pro- progresses, uh, I have that written further phenom- in the script as well. A <laughs> phenomenon of black migration to northern urban areas begins. Right. Uh, because uh, what is occurring in the South is obviously a, a stultified regime of brutal racial apartheid. Uh, but in addition to that, an increased uh, mechanization of agriculture that reduces the number of people who are needed to uh, do the uh, farm work of the southern planter economy. Uh, and that situation, coupled with the fact that it fucking sucked to live in, le- leads to a huge migration uh, of uh, blacks to urban areas. And what essentially happens is is that the monomaniacal racial fixation that dominated southern uh uh, class, the, the the regional southern uh, uh, centers of rule that had been uh, defeated in the Civil War, but then accommodated into and 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 uh, assimilated into capital flows from the north uh, and political organizations around uh, that those cap that capital uh, was exported nat- nationwide mm-hmm. as racial anxiety spikes uh, among populations for whom. The racial question had been abstract until this point, right? Uh, and th- it's important also to remember that it's not just uh, blacks moving to cities. Uh, the 19th century sees a steady urbanization of the American po- uh, uh, population, and between 1910 and 1920, the United States goes finally to a majority urban population, uh, and that is uh, very socially destabilizing mm-hmm. and leads to a lot of. Uh, uh, anxiety. I mean, this is in a many real sense, in, in a real sense, uh, for many, the death of the yeoman dream, uh, as people are being uh, pulled into wage relationships uh, in these atomized, uh, uh, socially uprooted situations in urban cities, and that leads to uh, a, a explosion of racial anxiety that culminates in the formation of the modern Klan, mm-hmm. uh, and also um, sees the Republican Party. Uh, seed the field completely in order to uh, not alienate this newly racially aware voting population. Honestly, this is kind of way more time on Taft than I had expected. Uh, but, you know, as I was reading and putting this together, he is kind of this pivotal figure of this moment, continuing so- only some of the good positive trends of the Roosevelt administration and a lot of of the bad ones, specifically the quick advancement and institutionalization of American imperial interests throughout the hemisphere so any final thoughts on taft before we move on uh just on a personal level he is a a sympathetic figure for me a round boy (laughs) um, uh, a baseball fan which is after my heart uh, a gentleman who got literally did get stuck in a bathtub when he was president that's not an urban legend he did get stuck in the tub they had to give him a bigger one uh wife had the stroke never really wanted the job anyway wasn't even supposed to be here today uh, but the very fact of that, his lack of investment in any of the pageantry, in any of the stuff that animated Roosevelt, mm-hmm. and the fact that the things kept moving, the machinery kept moving, the progressive agenda continued to work its way uh, through government institutions really shows that uh, at a certain level, people become superfluous to processes right. once an inflection point has been reached. And Taft, in his immense person personifies that yeah he is the he is the mechanization of of a lot of these processes in his his lack of desire to to have will or charisma or anything anything, yeah uh man i just want to golf (laughs) the election of 1912 is a doozy with a lot of firsts and onlys in it by 1912 a complete rift had developed between roosevelt and taft After first promising not to run for a third term in 1908, then doing the whole, well, if nominated, I will serve shtick in 1911 and early 1912, by the time the convention rolls around, Teddy Roosevelt is all in. Here's Teddy in his own words. I am not leading this fight as a matter of aesthetic pleasure. I am leading because somebody must lead or else the fight would not be made at all. I prefer to work with moderate, with rational conservatives, provided only that they do in good faith strive forward towards the light. But when they halt and turn their backs to the light, sit with the scorners on the seats of reaction, then I must part company with them. We, the people, cannot turn that. Our aim must be steady, wise folks. This is also the first major election in which presidential primaries served an important role. Twelve states held Republican primaries in 1912. Wisconsin Senator Robert Fightin' Bob LaFollette took the first two in North Dakota and, of course, in Wisconsin. 
Roosevelt then won nine of the next 10 primaries, signaling his challenge was real and the tensions grew. Roosevelt called Taft a puzzle wit. What? Then Taft retorted that Roosevelt was a honey fuggler. Oh, snap. One Roosevelt reporter commented, quote, Taft certainly made a great mistake when he began to fight back. He has too big a paunch to have much of a punch. While a free-for-all slap, bang, and kick him in the belly is just nuts for the chief. Uh, so those are some choice 1912 fighting words. Oh, man. It's funny that people really did talk like that. They really did talk like that. <laughs> Adorable. Yes, it is. It's very funny. Like a, like a race of sprites <laughs> from, a, from a foreign land. However, at the convention in Chicago, Taft had most of the conservative institutions of the Republican Party wired for him. Most of the unpledged delegates fell towards him, and he was renominated on the first ballot. This caused a split with Republican progressives in the party. They then formed their own party, held a convention in Chicago, and two months later nominated Roosevelt for president. And here we see the, the eventual overdetermining power of institutions. So Roosevelt, in his person, helps break the logjam of the Gilded Age politics and embodies this change. But in so doing, he creates a, a, uh, a new P Republican party that has synthesized the currents, mm -hmm. but towards the end of preserving itself. Right. Not an individual ego or, or some romantic vision that might animate individual politicians. The, 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 uh, at positions of power uh, is con are concentrated the people who understand what their job is. Mm -hmm. And so uh, because Roosevelt mar 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 mounting this uh, challenge from outside all norms and traditions has to, by definition, have uh, with him the justification of being more of what the party claims to be is therefore a threat to the established party because that undermines their uh, interests, which have been solidified. Uh, and so a properly organized political party in you know, the American system faced with a challenge like Roosevelt knows what to do, which is sacrifice itself. They know that, that Roosevelt very well might run against them and mm -hmm. then send the election to the other party, but they understand that it is more important for themselves that they maintain their positions within the party, right. than that the party win. Right. That will be that's that will be the uh, the self interest of a of a self aware political organism, uh, and that is what you see in 1912. And uh, and so the the yes the the regulars say I don't care that you have the actual popularity. You also are disrupting uh, our agenda, and so we will go with the guy who we can control and who represents us even if we lose, because then we, next time we're still in charge. We haven't disrupted things in a way that might cost us power. Meanwhile, in Baltimore, the Democratic convention was also split between the conservative elements and the progressives. Speaker of the House Champ Clark was an initial front runner, and I know he doesn't get very close, but I do wish that at one point we had a President Champ. President Champ, like a fucking golden retriever <laughs> in the White House, just sitting there behind the resolute desk, slobbering all over the papers. Wonderful. Uh, Champ Clark was an initial front runner, but after the Tammany Hall political machine threw its support for Clark, William Jennings Bryan and the progressives balked and went for the progressive governor of New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson. Wilson was nominated on the 46th ballot, and progressives again held sway over the party. Uh, I know you just did a bunch of this stuff, but you want to spool out how the general election finishes up. So you have it. Uh, a three-way race for the president where for the first time the third party uh, could win hypothetically yes. uh, and the bull moose progresses a cargo cult around the person of Roosevelt and the idea that that uh, everything wrong with the country uh, everything about this deal we're making with capital the deal we're making with this machinery of, of, of rationalization uh, can be a better deal if it's being done by the man yeah. by, by Colonel Roosevelt the idea that the will can can defeat this machinery, uh, uh, and of course that's very uh, seductive. And of course, faced with the the, the gray figure of Roosevelt, the institutional man or uh, Taft, the institutional manifestation of the Republican Party, uh, Roosevelt actually did better than Taft, leaving Wilson to having uh, by embodying progressivism in his own self uh, to. Push beyond the solid South by no longer just representing that, representing the new understood main current of progressivism. Yeah, let's listen to Woodrow speak a bit on that. The democratic program is this. To see to it that competition is so regulated 
that the big fellow cannot put the little fellow out of business. For he has been putting the little fellow out of business for the last half generation. The program of the third party is to take these big fellows that have been putting the little fellow out of business and regulate them. Saying that is all right, you have put the other fellows out of business, but we are not going to put the little fellows back where you destroy them. We are going to adopt you and say, run the business of the country, but run it in the way we tell you to run it. Uh, and then he won the three-way race. And Taft becomes the only sitting president to ever finish third in both electoral votes and popular votes. So Taft and Roosevelt split the Republican vote and Woodrow Wilson sweeps in a landslide, winning a record 40 states, though with only 42 percent of the popular vote, the lowest for a winning president since 1860. Roosevelt picked up six states and the poor bastard Taft won only Vermont and Utah. That's got to wait. His eight electoral votes are still the lowest for a Democrat or a Republican in any general election. But I doubt Taft really cared that much. In 1921, he got his dream and was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, a position he held for nine years. Oh, he must have been so happy. Hey, he got he got it in the end. Uh, Kept tantalizingly out of his reach for so long. And then he got in and made a I get to wear a fucking uh, robe to work. This is my dream come true. (laughs) Taft is also our last president with facial hair. Yep. Uh, don't know exactly what that means or implies. Uh, you know, sound off in the comments. Woodrow Wilson. In many ways, Woodrow Wilson solves a key 19th century conflict among the Democratic and Progressive Coalition by answering the question what if a racist was smart? Thomas Woodrow Wilson was born December 28th in 1856 in Virginia, but his family migrated to Augusta, Georgia in his early childhood. Wilson's father was a Presbyterian minister and was closely linked to the Southern Presbyterian Church, as well as dedicated supporters of the Confederacy. So young Thomas grew up in that environment before heading to Princeton University, which was then simply the College of New Jersey, to study history and political philosophy. Wilson went on to briefly study law at University of Virginia, finished his legal education on his own, and passed the Georgia Bar in 1882. Uh, But finding the actual practice of law less interesting than its history and theory, Wilson concluded that he must become a professor basically just so he could read professionally. Nerd alert. Nerd alert. So in 1883, Wilson enrolls in a doctoral program at Johns Hopkins University. There he earns a PhD writing Congressional Government, A Study in American Politics, a commentary on the form and function of U.S. Congress, commenting on the structure of the parties as they existed in the 1880s as more electoral vehicles and organizing bodies within Congress, and containing such quotables as, Congress in session is Congress on public exhibition. Congress in its committee rooms is Congress at work. Uh, It was published in 1885 and got him favorable attention as a constitutional scholar. From there, Wilson teaches at Bryn Mawr, then Wesleyan, and then in 1890 landed a job at Princeton. In 1902, he was appointed president of Princeton, where he institutionalized policies to make study more rigorous uh, and was an effective fundraiser. He also appointed Jews and Catholics to the faculty, but worked to keep blacks out of the school, even as other Ivies were beginning to admit them. In 1910... State Democrat bosses put Wilson up for governor of New Jersey, seeking a new type of candidate without much experience they could potentially control. Wilson ran as a progressive and handily won the state, and as governor, Wilson quickly passed a slate of progressive legislation, instituting primaries to undercut the political bosses and supporting workers' rights, as well as some antitrust acts. And with that, he became one of the frontrunners for the Democratic nomination for president, a Southern Dem who became famous as a Northern academic, a progressive who undermined the political bosses who could win support of the Bryan wing. So let's see this egghead in office. So Woodrow Wilson truly is the uh, Southern aristocrat uh, housebroken. Mm -hmm. Uh, He is that tradition of uh, American uh, ruling class political uh, identity that was one of the main currents of the founder, the, 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 the plantation lord who, who Wilson is descended from uh, and who fought to, to defend a, uh, a, a land-based feudal vision uh, in the face of encroaching, cap- encroaching capitalism and were defeated. Mm-hmm. And in their defeat had to come to terms 
uh, with their condition. And that meant uh, uh, taming their more ferocious uh, objections to modernity, basically. <laughs> uh, and Wilson exemplifies that movement. He is the child of the, of the Southern plantation aristocracy, but instead of becoming a horse lord and a <laughs> fake chivalric knight, he goes to college. Right. He gets more knowledge. He learns how the system works, and he is able to take the uh, the visceral imperatives of the southern uh, uh, ruling elite, racial apartheid, number one, and synthesize them uh, through the mechanisms of northern uh, 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 manners building and etiquette that make up the collegiate experience. He is able to govern as a scientific and rational racist, <laughs> uh, uh, but also a scientific and rational progressive, a scientific and rational imperialist, uh, but all of this to not maintain uh, 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 capitalism in its in its raw form, but to maintain what he imagines as American civilization, uh, and his presidency really uh, uh, shows that an advanced uh, uh, nerdlinger who has has studied the master understands the implications, and at every point tries to synthesize the conflicts. Uh, and to, and as such, that's why his foreign policy is so interesting and important because he was attempting to, to formalize a system of international cooperation that would allow for capitalism to operate internationally. And that kind of vision was very rare at the time. And, uh, it, I think more than anything came from, uh, having that position as a, uh, self-conscious like subject within America who had to come to terms with it and, and, and uh, affirm its power by understanding its mechanisms. Uh, so obviously a centerpiece of the Woodrow Wilson administration is World War I, but before we go to war, let's clear up Wilson's domestic agenda. So the Dems get in there and get to work on the tariff as always. <sighs> Fucking tariff, man. It's, <laughs> we're doing this, there's a few things you just get so tired of hearing about. Uh, but here... We get to the end of this discussion. After some finagling, they pass the Revenue Act of 1913, which lowers tariffs on average by 14%, but more of more lasting importance, this is the act that finally implements a newly constitutional income tax. Mm. And though the initial income tax only affected the highest earners, uh, 1% income tax on people own, earning over $3,000 and 6% on those owning more than $500,000, uh, and also on corporations, the Supreme Court upholds it, and by the end of the 20s, federal revenue would be coming primarily from taxes. And this is another part of the rationalization of government, taking away uh, from regional interests, uh, regional prerogatives. And the problem with the fucking tariff had always been that different sections had different interests in the tariff. Mm -hmm. And uh, replacing that with an income tax nationalizes the question of revenue and removes from it the old associations that had dominated politics and that formed people's political identity. Right. Uh, and was and was now uh, pulled out of that soup towards this new understanding of a national uh, population uh, who could then be taxed on basis of their in interact interaction with the market, which was now universal. Uh, and most of the prerogatives that had undergirded the terrorist system were now superseded by the creation of this new system. We didn't need to protect industry because American industry was now uh, hemispherically hegemonic. Uh, and the, the client patronage networks that uh, tariff revenue had uh, previously supported were now also being rationalized into the market as well. Wilson's other major first-term accomplishment is, holy fuck, we're finally resolving the fucking banking issue. Got rid of tariffs, got rid of the bank. Yes. And the thing that these have in common is that they are both taking away from the, pu the public do democratic uh, contest questions of economic destiny. And it only took like 125 years to do it. But here we go. Wilson chartered a compromise position between those like the progressive Bryanites who feared the influence of Wall Street bankers and the conservative Republicans who represented those bankers' very interests. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913 created the 12 semi-private regional Federal Reserve banks and the Central Federal Reserve with a board of presidential appointees and finally creating the Federal Reserve notes guaranteed by the government that we know today as money. Now you don't have to worry about J.P. Morgan showing up. You've got the government doing that. You've got the government deciding the monetary supply and, as I said, uh, taking another uh lever of economic policy out of public disputation this is the 
This is a appointed governors with fixed 20 year terms, like the Supreme Court taking mm -hmm. uh, as you take law, you take money out of public discussion. And you really see throughout the 19th and 20th century here, the process where the, cons the, the Constitution's theoretical conception of popular sovereignty uh, colliding with the emergent uh, uh, concentration of capital and, as, and the in, uh, increased power and uh, organizing capacity of the working class. Mm -hmm. And as that happens, as, as, as the American public comes more into self-awareness of, of itself as a, uh, as a group with interests – and as they increase their ability to exert those interests through political structures, those uh, levers get taken away. Uh, the cookie jar gets put on the <laughs> top of the fridge, yes. not on the counter, so that you can continue <laughs> democracy right. without threatening, through the intervention of some sort of organized working class uh, claim for power, through formal means, uh, the, the danger of those, those levers being taken from capital. And uh, yes, we have resolved the bank system, bank problem, as we resolved uh, the tariff problem. The 19th century blood wars are over. We're going to bury the bloody shirt once and for all uh, in this new rationalized system, which can be less passionate because the stakes are lower, because the real questions are no longer democratically determined uh, or even theoretically democratically determined. Uh, and this means that uh, on key questions, the only stakeholders are the only people in any meaningful room to make decisions will be stakeholders in the system with no actual material connection to anybody outside of the system. Uh, and that is an incredibly important stabilizing force, frankly, that helps America compete for uh, global dominance in the 20th century. Uh, and this machinery is immediately put to use, funding the allies, even though the the center of American uh, public opinion on World War I was strict neutrality. Uh, meanwhile, our financial institutions picked a side and essentially forced us into commitment to the Allies without any public intervention. Before we get to war, we do have to note Wilson's abysmal civil rights record. Wilson accelerated segregation in both government offices and the military, further entrenching Jim Crow at a federal level. Though in Wilson and his advisors' framing, these policies erased friction or whatever in the workplace, as W.E.B. Du Bois pointed out in an open letter to Wilson, it led to such insane circumstances as a black worker who could not be physically separated from his colleagues on account of the nature of his work having a cage built around him. Wilson also notably screened and praised the wildly racist lost cause film Birth of a Nation at the White House. All to say, even as Wilson represented the pinnacle of progressivism, the political reality of racial animus still found an easy home in it. Yes, Wilson really uh, was, he exemplified at the time the rising racial anxiety of a country that was seeing uh, Southern blacks move into northern cities as part of the first great migration. And, uh, and he was resonating off the frequency of a, of a restive urban white population that began to uh, panic at the thought of uh, their communities being integrated. And there was the Red Summer of 1919, uh, was right after World War II ended, uh, when there was a wave of white-led race riots uh, throughout American cities, north and south, uh, between uh, uh, po policing color lines. Uh, and Wilson was an embodiment of that uh, entire moment uh, because uh, for the first time, uh, people in the urban centers, educated folks, not part of the Southern uh, post-slave social order, uh, were having to consider the, uh, the reality of treating black people as political equals. And as fellow citizens, and not having it be a uh, a question for a region, uh, but for uh, a whole nation, and they reacted with a, a violent panic, and and it all was articulated in the White House in, from the mouth of Wilson and from the policies. Wilson also pushed a slew of antitrust legislation and some labor reforms. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, talk, let's talk war. War? What is it good for? Hell yeah. World War I. 
is on one hand an enormously complicated and deadly conflict involving all the European great powers fought around the world and with origins, immediate and proximate causes, justifications, and entanglements, it could take an entire 20-episode podcast series to even begin to explain. On the other hand, it's the Cousins War. It's the war where all the European monarchs who were inbred cousins backed themselves into a political corner and could only get out by throwing 20 million of the lives of their own people into a big fiery pit for basically no gain. The mustache war. Who has the coolest mustache in Europe? Well, we're going to kill uh, 200,000 people in a day to figure it out. Yep. Uh, so, as with all the wars, I'm not going to get too much into the actual process of the war. Uh, there's too much there, but we're going to focus on American policy around it and Wilson's positions. So, uh, as I said, the uh, American public, when World War I broke out, was uh, unified in, largely unified in a desire to avoid it. It, it was... Uh, a conflict within the alliance system of Europe that America really was outside of. Yeah. But we were also part of an Anglo-American trading network that meant that we were, we had a side, even if we didn't all publicly uh, think that we had a side. Uh, Bismarck said that the most consequential political fact of the 20th century was that the United States spoke English. (laughs) Uh, And what that really means is that because it was the Anglos who have birthed modern capitalism before uh, connecting it to the conveyor belt of American uh, resources, uh, America was committed uh, uh, to the Anglo uh, uh, section of international capitalism, which at this point was still competing in a, in a state framework. Uh, and that is really what World War I was. It was a bunch of capitalist countries finding themselves forced to uh, come to blows to resolve these issues because there was no superseding international bourgeois to intervene on them at that point. Mm -hmm. Uh, And America was really orthogonal to this entire conflict. Uh, And so Americans didn't want to go to war. I mean, part of the reason is that a huge chunk of Americans at that point were relatively recent immigrants from Germany. Right. Uh, uh, Where where both uh, both Chris and I grew up, (laughs) the the average person uh, either was from Germany, descended from Germans, probably spoke German as a first language. Uh, Um, And my my two grandparents side, Steiner and Weber. Yeah. Uh, Well, every uh, socialist party in Europe, except for the Russians, fell over themselves to support the war. The United States Socialist Party came out four square against it uh and we'll talk more about the socialists later uh but so there's no popular desire to intervene in this goddamn thing uh and meanwhile we're lending money like crazy to one side Mm -hmm. money is being lent to both sides of course but way more money is being lent to the allies and in fact william jennings bryan who was brought on as a consolation prize as the secretary of uh state uh for wilson's cabinet resigns uh in protest to the fact that the united states is picking aside it is providing financial support go governmentally and privately for the allies kind of says i think a lot about brian's uh, uh kind of moral fortitude there that he's tried so hard so many times to get to be president and finally gets in there to be secretary of state and then gives it up because he is uh you know morally opposed yeah. to the decisions of it so good on you brian from 1913 to 1918, American exports to the war rose from eight to 824.8 million to 2.25 billion. And that's a lot back then. Yes. Bethlehem Steel produced over a billion pounds of steel for shells. The U.S. was intimately linked to the Allied war effort. So, yeah, there are a lot of other causes that lead up to it. They're shifting a public opinion. There's the stuff you learn about in uh, school, like the sinking of merchant ships. The Zimmerman telegram. Zimmerman telegram. The sinking of the Lusitania. Oh, the Lusitania. Oh, that's... Which was sank in 1915. Yes. We didn't declare war until 1917. Uh, All that stuff you probably heard of. uh, But in the end, these seem... These end up seeming more like justifications around this main point of getting our fucking money back. Honestly, if you want to understand how American propaganda works in American education, you can do no better than looking at the standard American understanding in school textbooks of World War I. Mm -hmm. It is, well, you know what? We didn't want to fight, but the goddamn Germans kept provoking us. Yes. That's, oh, they tried to raise up the Mexicans. They tried to, they sunk our beloved Lusitania. Call back to, they're impressing our seamen. Exactly. Yes. The the real reason is that we were pot committed to a side and we we could not let it go the the, uh, the wrong way. Wilson wins re-election in 1916, literally on the slogan, he kept us out of war. And that was after the Lusitania sank. Yes. He ran and won on he kept us out of war after the precious Lusitania got sunk. 
Is it, did it take us that long to get pissed? Yes. About, well, look, news traveled slower that we day. Didn't, we didn't find out until 1917 that there was a really adorable corgi on the fucking uh, Lusitania <laughs> that died. Uh, we don't need to go too much into it. Uh, 1916 election, a lot closer uh, than 1912 with the Republican Party reunified against him. So obviously no bull moose in 1916. Uh, Wilson defeats Charles Evans Hughes, the only Supreme Court justice to win, to run as a major party nominee. It was so close, parenthetically, that uh, Hughes went to bed thinking he'd won. Mm-hmm. Uh, and only in the morning was he disabused of the notion. So on April 2nd, 1917, uh, like a month into the second term uh, that, again, Wilson ran on keeping us out of war for, Wilson goes to Congress and asks for a declaration of war. Uh, Congress declares war on April 6th, and we're off. Uh, you prob- Matt, you probably know more about the actual U.S. involvement in ending the war. Uh, I don't know how much we want to get into it, but you can go for it. Uh, honestly, it's it's really a question, open question of what, whether the United States intervention tip the scales right there's there's this very strong argument to be made that the germans were beat by that point uh really the real importance of uh world war one uh in the united states is domestically right uh the united the 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 war effort uh is really the the uh creation of modern state propaganda Mm -hmm. uh the 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 consent model the consent manufacturing machinery in a new era of mass politics mass communication and mass media was built to sell world war one, Edward Bernays, uh, Sigmund Freud's son-in-law, mm-hmm. uh, was uh, the maestro of uh, the effort to convince America, who didn't want to fight in World War One, that it was their patriotic duty to do so. And it, you saw in it a uh, the hysteria uh, uh, around race and uh, and ethnicity, this time put against Germans. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the, the uh, sauerkraut was renamed Liberty Cabbage. Uh, there were anti-German hate crimes across the country. German... Uh, S- names for st- cities across the country were changed. Uh, I'm from Wisconsin. There's a city there. Uh, uh, there's a suburb of Milwaukee called New Berlin. And I am 100% convinced that it used to be New Berlin. <laughs> uh, they the, just changed the they accent changed on the, it? Co- they changed the pronunciation of Berlin. To Berlin. To Berlin. Uh, and and most importantly, uh, so, it, so popular appeals around patriotism and, and ethnic hysteria help motivate people but the real benefit in the long term is that it allowed the uh the american labor movement to be essentially decapitated uh so uh after the assimilation of the populists into the democrats resistance to the capitalist order uh, had started to organize explicitly along anti-capitalist lines people were now no longer saying we want a, f- uh, a fair deal from the the constitutional order they were saying the constitutional order is created to by capital they recognized the enemy and the socialist party of america was founded out of this ferment in 1901 out of a merger of several existing uh, socialist groups and eugene debs who'd been radicalized by his experience in the pullman strike uh became an early leader the socialists no longer held the anti-monopolist dream of a country of small producers working in harmony they had absorbed the marxist insight that the conflict between workers and owners was intractable and that the workers must unite to overthrow the dominion of capital the brutality of, of the labor struggles, a litany of state and private violence visited upon workers seeking control of their lives during this time helped gain the socialist adherence among work, urban workers and at the same time attracting the support of many of the Western farmers mm-hmm. who had built the Populist Party. While the Republicans and Democrats came to a bipartisan consensus around the progressive agenda of reforming capitalism, the Socialist Party gained supporters and elected officials to positions for uh, city council, mayor, congressperson across the country on a platform of abolishing capitalism. Socialism is merely the extension of the idea of democracy to the economic field, as Debs called it. Debs ran for president under the Socialist Party banner in 1904, 1908, 1912, and 1920. He gained an increased number of popular votes in each election, culminating in 1920 when Debs secured over 3% of the vote from a prison cell. The Great War provided a pretext for the progressives to break the nascent socialist movement with the Espionage Act, which made public resistance to the military draft illegal. And to, unlike the Socialist Parties of Western Europe, the Socialist Party of America had refused to support the war effort. And in 1918, 
Debs was arrested after giving a speech against the war in Canton, Ohio. He was sentenced to a decade in prison. Meanwhile, Wilson's Justice Department, under Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, carried out a series of raids against socialists, communists, and anarchists who could be condemned as un-American for their anti-war sentiment and their support of Bolshevik Russia. The same propaganda machinery that turned the new tools of mass media to manufacture consent for entry into the war went to work demonizing the socialist movement and the labor movement more broadly. The next decade would be a period of profound disarray for American labor, with a wave of post-war strikes broken, the the major parties and unions riven by disputes over how to relate to the New World Communist Movement headquartered at Moscow, and drowned in the easy credit of of the Roaring Twenties. But it all began with the war fever and engineered uh, in Washington and New York uh, that overwhelmed the the labor movement and uh, saved Anglo-American capitalism. So, speaking of the Bolsheviks, Russia has a revolution and leaves the war. (laughs) Germany finally collapses and the Allies end up the victors. And Wilson earns himself and the USA a seat at the great table of nations to negotiate a new world order as a poli sci guy this was wilson's golden opportunity he's got his 14 points his league of nations and we're going to establish a new liberal democratic international order matt what's wilson's order so once again we see the nerd who's been paying attention seeing the contours and understanding that the implications of world war one is that we can no longer have national bourgeois operating independently of one another in an age of mass military mobilization and mass military technology. You'll just kill everybody. You'll destroy the, you will <laughs> kill the gold, one new direction. You will kill the golden goose of product of profit by fighting over it. You need to create international institutions that like the same way the United States state abrogated uh, uh, administrative uh, decisions from capital, the international uh government the world government would regulate them among national bourgeois uh but tragically for wilson he was the only one who recognized that uh because the country at large was still uh cleaving towards notions of yeoman self-sufficiency and uh that required uh and and that meant they were hostile and suspicious of international ties that would pull power and authority away from them uh and of course in europe everybody had just spent the last four years killing each other to the tune of millions 20 million mm-hmm. casualties the mass destruction of cities the mass destruction of uh of resources uh, someone needed to pay and so while wilson went to versailles thinking he was jesus christ as clement as lloyd george said uh and uh he proposed a a, a league of nations and a 14 points that would codify a global rule he was really prefiguring the post-war order that the united states would involve but by that point europe had just not suffered enough for them to uh take the deal basically there was still enough independent authority within those states uh to resist it and there was insufficient popular support for it in the united states uh to allow wilson to carry it uh carry his idea into america his league of nations uh push was defeated in congress uh and so you see this person who sees the moment understands it but is unable to assert his will because the conditions have not yet ripened for it. Uh, and it doesn't help that his brain explodes. Yeah, it, like the pressure of the whole thing. It, it was while negotiating that his uh, fucking uh, stroke happened uh, and, he try, and he had to spend the rest of that crucial term uh, trying to get America to sign on to the League of Nations while, uh, while basically incapacitated. And as a result, failing. And the League of Nations... While it is adopted in Europe and among uh, the European powers, is not joined by the United States, which would have been required to give it any real authority. And so we wrap up this era of these progressive bros, the jock, the judge, and the poindexter. In 1920 rolls around, the Democrats had just had their first president to win re-election since Andrew Jackson, which is kind of amazing. Uh, presided over by a massive economic expansion, a string of stunning nation-changing victories for a now three-decade-long buildup of the progressive movement. I mean, God, we didn't even mention prohibition and women's suffrage. These both happened under Wilson. He had kept us out of war. He got us into the war and won, and now presents this nice civil idea of a League of Nations to manage the continual peace for the whole world. 
With all that in place, the Democrats get simply destroyed in the election of 1920. So you see coming due now the bill of the progressive uh, movement. Uh, As always, it pushes... Uh, things past what people are expecting them to be and then they see the result and are horrified by it uh and specifically in wilson's case uh the the necessity of american entry into the war as understood by people like wilson uh is punished by a population that really even though they were suborned into war fever never really wanted the war and Mm -hmm. once it ended in squalor and horror at versailles had no belief that their uh sacrifice uh, had been justified. Uh, and so you see poor poor Woodrow Wilson, the guy who thought he could who thought he had cr- solved the matrix and that he could ride the tide of engineered power of, by mastering the machinery and the mechanisms of American constitutional order, uh, would be able to uh, assert his will both domestically and then around the world, finding his individual ability uh, second to the task uh, once uh, he overshot the moment, essentially. And so after all that victory, the message that wins in the end of the day is that nobody from Ohio with the simple pledge of, hey, let's stop doing stuff. Let's cool out. Let's chill out. Uh, Yes, we're back into another chill out tent of American presidential history. (laughs) Up next is the return to normalcy. Hell of Presidents is produced by me, Chris Wade, with our co-editor, Nick Quaz. Our theme music is by Nick Diamonds. Additional music for this episode by Alessandro Takeshi, whose album Songs About Cars is available at alessandrotakeshi.bandcamp.com. And by Blackout Princess, whose music you can find at blackoutprincess.bandcamp.com. And by Nick Allen, whose music you can find on Spotify as the band The Exclusive. Our episode art is, as always, by Branson Reese. Join us next week for the adventures of Horny Harding and the Teapot Dome.